welcome to uh, session two of the afternoon, um, our session on non-professional Shakespeare, uh, which until really comparatively recently was one of the taboos of, of serious academic professional Shakespearean performance studies. You, know, you were expected to write only about people who were being paid to do it, uh, uh, rather than recognizing that actually people like Shakespeare, people like performing Shakespeare, uh, and people like seeing members of their family performing Shakespeare, not necessarily for the same reasons they like seeing professionals do it, but nonetheless, um, that the, the performance of Shakespeare is a folk art, an art that belongs to the people, uh, as well as um, a high art uh, cherished by carefully trained professionals. Uh, so I have with me this afternoon um, two uh, supreme exemplars and, and uh, participants in this phenomenon. Pauline Scott uh, from uh, Brownsea Island Open Air Theatre, and that's Brownsea Island you can see behind me, uh, which as you'll have gathered is an island. Um, it's in Pool Harbour. Uh, there's been um, a Shakespeare play performed there in the open air, um, and despite the island's population of noisy peacocks, um, every summer until the pandemic uh, since 1964. Uh, Ian Wainwright uh, has been in charge of the Royal Shakespeare Company's extensive liaison work with non-professional groups um, for the last 10 years and more, the Open Stages project. Uh, he was involved in the great Dream 16 tour when an RSC production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, directed by Erica Wyman, toured to all the regions and nations of the United Kingdom with a different local group of non-professional actors uh, playing the roles of the non-professional actors uh, in the play. Uh, and I'm uh, looking forward to you know, watching his expression as he relives some of that experience. <laughs> <laughs> a little later in, in this afternoon's 40 minute session. But I want to turn first to Pauline because you know, this is still a topic which is you know, addressed comparatively rarely in um, conferences about Shakespeare um, and, and understudied, underdocumented. Um, tell us about Brownsea. Um, who is it for? Who does it? Uh, how did it come to be that people began to began to strand themselves on this island in the summer uh, and do Shakespeare there? Right. Good afternoon. And first of all, I'd just like to say thank you very much for inviting me to represent Brancy Open Air Theatre. Um, we feel very privileged to be part of your alliance. So thank you very much. Um, if I just go over a little bit of the history, how it all started, um, the National Trust actually became owners of Brownsea and in 1964, um, they decided to celebrate Shakespeare's 400th anniversary of his birth. And to do this, they wanted to put in on a Shakespeare production. Um, at the time, Bournemouth Little Theatre Club, who had their own theatre on the mainland, took up this challenge. And it was quite a challenge because at that time, open air theatre wasn't that common as it is nowadays. So a little intrepid group of actors went across to the island with minimum resources. Uh, basically, they had no set. Literally, the trees were their background. Um, halfway through, after the interval, it gets dark. They had one electric point. <laughs> and two floodlights, which lit up the second half. And, um, and that was the start of Brownsea Open Air Theatre. They actually did The Tempest and they were planning to do three nights, but in fact, they ended up doing a fourth because it became so popular. So they suddenly realized, look, this is something we have an audience for. So it then became an annual event and Brownsea Open Air Theatre was born. And if I now roll on sort of to 2019, um, that was our 56th 
production on the island. And um, we've actually done 28 different Shakespeare plays, bar one, when we did A Man for All Seasons. I'm not quite sure why. Mm. Mm. Um, we perform to around 4,000 people annually. And these are not only locals, we, we do seem to draw from all over. Um, so, and I think there, there is this magic of the island and the magic of going across. Um, you can have a picnic there before the performance. So the whole thing is very mm. different. Um, yeah. And obviously, as I say, they, there was no set then, of course now, yeah. We have a huge set. We have raked seating, which is numbered. We have full lighting, sound, etc. So it's completely different. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a genuinely immersive experience, as you say. I mean, you, you could make the analog, you know, the analogy to um, self-described immersive theatre groups, especially when you're doing the Tempest and you really are stranded on an island. Um, you know possibly praying to be to be let off it and I love the way you talk about there being brown sea and the mainland you know there there's, brown sea and there's theaters on the mainland and, and you know those are the two categories of theater I, don't, I think that's um it's it's I, I've been immensely impressed to see how much um your company has stayed alive and stayed active during the pandemic doing um, online things. Yeah. Um, do you feel that there's a, a community of Brown Sea connoisseurs or, or addicts or, or friends who, to whom you, the, you now have a kind of duty to, to supply some kind of fix for the time being? Yeah, we do seem to have quite a following. And I mean, even people have given us donations during our time online. Um, and we called ourselves, as we were going online, um, a Boat at Home, and mm. we had two seasons. And our first season, we actually just streamed previous productions. And we tried to choose things that were pretty popular mm. um, and things that were fairly current as well. Um, and that seemed to go down very well. We did it on a Saturday night, and then it was available mm. three days afterwards. Mm. Um, yeah. And what we did from April, and then in August, we decided to do season two of Boat at Home. And that was actual extracts from different Shakespeare productions. Mm. But that in a way, um, because we were in lockdown, we really had to start to use technology. And mm. I will be absolutely honest, we are extremely lucky because we do have a very good technical department and the people in it are professionals. Um, but obviously the, the time they give is voluntary. Um, so we can do things that are a little bit more innovative. Um, yeah. For example, we did Hamlet and it was done as Elsinore security cameras pointed on different parts of the castle when Hamlet's father appears as a ghost. Um, mm. And then each actor recorded their own um, scene and sent it to our technology department and they did mm. The magic. Mm. So yeah. we're very lucky. Yeah. I think it's very striking the way amateur theatre groups have been able to embrace the sort of YouTube model of making video, uh, sharing videos of themselves acting Shakespeare in that non-professional theatre is a kind of user-created content. Um, and that sense that YouTube contains a range of stuff, some of which is people doing things in their bedroom, some of which is trailers for Hollywood movies, yeah. extremely high production values, that's kind of helped break down yeah. Yeah. the sense that there's the serious, real professional stuff and then, you know, stuff that fans do in corners. Yeah, okay. and I think with having a department that we do, ours do look reasonably professional. We have yeah. our own YouTube yeah. channel and we were able to put yeah. trailers up prior to the um, Shakespeare shorts going live. Yeah. All that helps to bring in our audience. Mm. I've, I'm interested that there's still eight plays that Brownsey hasn't done. And I'm wondering what they are. So, you know, I've, I've seen you do Titus Andronicus, mm -hmm. yeah. which isn't, isn't an obvious choice for no. an amateur family show done in the open air. It, with was, 
with the picnic. We, I did um, I do think we lost some audience then, but they'd come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and not they, literally. <laughs> yes, yes, and they, they, they certainly didn't leave during the performance because <laughs> <laughs> unless they were prepared to swim to get away from Titus Andronicus, but it's quite a long way. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm, well, I will keep guessing as, and, and trying to go through your records and, and, and see which ones you haven't done yet. Um, Ian, you went to Brown. So, yeah, I mean, you, you've seen uh, non-professional groups all over the country. And of course yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, we were privileged enough to, uh, through Open Stage as our, our large engagement project. That when I was a little bit shocked early on when you said it probably is about 10 years, isn't it, actually, of, of um, doing that. I was yeah, bringing it down yeah. to six, then four, and then realised it probably is about 10 years of engagement with yeah, animated yeah. theatre companies. And it's been a kind of voyage of, of exploration and I've been sort of privileged enough to be in, in the sort of forefront of that and Brownsea is one of the places I very strongly remember going to and part of the sort of adventure of going there going on a boat over to the island and then and then finding this theatre in a glade there and <clears throat> Also, the idea that you guys are create of a huge amount of experience in outdoor theatre making, which we're as the RSC coming to uh, slightly later now, uh, creating an outdoor theatre now, due to, uh, just at this moment outside the Swan, for us to be able to perform in the summer. So we might be picking your brains a little bit about outdoor theatre, mm -hmm. outdoor Shakespeare work. But yes, we started about ten years ago, and it began under um, under the reign of Michael Boyd when we started working in the run up to the sort of 2020, 2012 Cultural Olympia, uh, Olympiad. We started to talk about engaging beyond like the RSC and with groups we hadn't worked with before. Michael had been talking very locally to amateur theatre makers uh, in Stratford upon Avon, of which there are quite a few. And we'd said we should work with them. And so I was brought on board to do that. And part of that was really a fact-finding mission to start with. I think we were quite alarmed, I think, by the amount of amateur theatre that was in the world. No one, I think particularly at that point, no one talks to professionals much about amateur theatre. No one wants to admit that they do it. No one talks to us about, about it uh, much, especially at that point in time. Yeah. So when we announced we were starting to work with amateur theatre groups, people would sidle up to us in the corridor. Someone from box office would say to us, I, I actually do a little bit of amateur theatre. You know? So one of the technicians actually helped, helped with an amateur theatre company. And it we slowly began to be revealed to us this huge parallel world of amateur theatre makers, a little bit like sort of Harry Potter or looking through the looking glass and finding <laughs> this parallel world of theatre making, which in many ways is larger than the professional world. We found there were a million people possibly doing amateur theatre making and not all these groups are known. So there isn't a place where they're all written down. In some senses, it was, that would be too dramatic, a sort of terrorist cell-like network <laughs> of people where these amateur theatres would pop up all over the place. Many of them, outdating professional theatre many of those companies are 100 years old many of them dating back to that growth in leisure time after the uh, uh, after the first world war and some of them incredibly new and there was a there was a stereotype i think in our mind and in professionals minds about what those amateur theatre makers were who they were what their audience was and that was really exploded by doing the open stages project where we started working we, we worked with about 300 amateur theatre companies all over the country and about we worked out that possibly up to 200,000 people had seen those shows that these amateur theatre makers had made during this period of time i think we also had a presumption that amateur theatre make a, a really foolish presumption didn't do a lot of Shakespeare, and we were completely disabused of that. Fair in very, and that there were companies, I think, like Brownsea, who had a real experience over many years of uh, of making Shakespeare, as well as companies who were coming to it sort of uh, fresh for the first time, and it fitted with the RSCs. The RSC's ethos is that Shakespeare belongs to everyone and that Shakespeare belongs to everyone to perform as well as to go and see. The performing of Shakespeare shouldn't belong to an elite, a group of Oxbridge, uh, Oxbridge educated directors or a group of highly trained sort of theatre athlete performers. Um, it should belong to everybody. 
And I think part of the ideals of the project, and I think the ideals of, of Amateur Shakespeare are a kind of Tyndale's Bible. We were sharing skills of, uh, and the idea that then people could interpret Shakespeare as they wanted to. We weren't telling people what they should be doing, but we were sharing how we worked. And one of the, I think that angle where we said, we want to share how we work, we don't want to tell you what you should be doing and be telling you to suck eggs how to do this because mm -hmm. I met many people when I was I was working on open stages and still do who've been in more Shakespeare plays than I've seen uh, so there's a well, a huge wealth of experience out there as far as uh, as making Shakespeare is concerned. Yeah. 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 There was also an element. Sorry, go, Mike, go, go on. No, I was going to mention the great name of K. Edmonds Gately, who, uh, you know, who was, I believe, the first, uh, and Nugent Monk, who were both non-professional directors who were among the first directors to be able to say that they had directed every single one of Shakespeare's plays. And uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't surprise me in the least. And I think, yeah. I think one of the other things we discovered was, was an interesting thing with diversity, which is, although I think the amateur theatre world will, somebody says, well, it's not as diverse, perhaps, as the professional theatre world, but it's diverse in often different ways. 60% mm. of the directors that, that we met, that we met, and I think this was very much true across the sector, were women, uh, very different from the, 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 profession, the professional world. And that idea was who was taking part in, in, those, in those productions was really interesting. We saw everybody from, there was a fantastic production of uh, Romeo and Juliet uh, by Rugby Theatre, where they worked with Polish migrant workers and they played Romeo and his family. And in fact, Romeo, I remember telling you about this, Michael, Romeo was played by a Polish cage fighter uh, which was fantastic, sort of. And when he walked on stage, he brought with him that sense, like a sort of caged tiger sense mm -hmm. as, he walked, uh, as he walked on stage. And Juliet was played by this lovely middle-class girl. And when you, they walked her on stage together, you immediately sympathised with those parents going, he looks like a dangerous guy that I don't <laughs> necessarily want my daughter to be with. <laughs> Nothing to do with his Polishness. I remember him discussing with us afterwards and saying that he had sewed the RSC's logo onto his cage fighting outfit, <laughs> which I felt the marketing department, uh, I didn't mention to, uh, as it wouldn't be yeah. perhaps the endorsement we were looking for. That, that's, fa that's fascinating. And I hope to see more members of the RSC in cages fighting uh, <laughs> when that it becomes once more um, feasible. Yeah, I mean, that, that sense that there's a sort of terrible barrier between the professional world and, and the non-professional world. Uh, and, you know, after all, most professional actors uh, became professional actors through being amateur actors. Yeah. You know, Kenneth Branagh is on, only was able to have his career because he spent his teenage years in an amateur theatre group in Reading that also had a filmmaking class. Yeah. You know, he could already... And that was, the sort of, that was the sort of thing we came across, those stories. When we, t what was interesting, we talked to our older actors at the RSC and they were very supportive of amateur theatre. One of the things they remembered rep in, uh, uh, where in town reps, they would share that auditorium and space yeah. with amateur. Yeah. Yeah. And during yeah. the rep period of time, uh, we found that there was a lot more crossover. Amateurs and professionals sat together and crossed over from one to the other. Yeah. People like yeah. Oliver Ford Davis, uh, at the RSC talking about being ed in Edinburgh grads and really yeah, that yeah. being the place uh, Richard Wilson being the place where they learned their craft in front yeah, of an yeah. audience and a yeah, particular yeah. type of character actor came through that period of time and one of the things I think we were uh, sort of sad about in some senses is that route isn't as open as it was the route mm. to professional theatre is a lot more through a drama school and into the profession. Although many yeah, people yeah. will have done amateur as a young person, yeah, we'd yeah. like to see that idea that like Richard Wilson, Oliver Ford Davis, they were both in their thirties when they made that move into professional and the, the incredible Charles Lawton, when yeah, they made yeah. that move across into professional theater. And I'd like to see that opened up more. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Oliver Ford Davis, of course, was in a student production of, um, Bartholomew Fair with Michael Billington, which came to Stratford 
uh, when they were about 20. I mean, you, you, you should hear them talking about it, listening to Justice Shallow and Justice Silence. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, rather wonderful. Yeah, um, you know, what, what, what an actor we lost in Michael Billington. Um, it's, but there's still, that, there's still that slight suspicion that amateurs who do it for free might do actors who need to pay the rent um, out, out, out of a living. And I know there were some rather tense negotiations around the Dream 16 project to allow equity members to work with um, people. Yeah, who yeah there was. Um, yeah. And actually, equity were very, very gracious in the end. I think they were they were making, they were holding the RSC's feet to the fire to make sure we weren't on a money saving exercise and, yeah, um, yeah. and we certainly weren't. And I think one of the things we pointed to uh, is we said, look, this is the same number of professional actors we'd usually use for a Midsummer Night's Dream. So this is mm. additional to that. Mm. Uh, and actually equity in there were very, very gracious about that, but their, their job is to protect the, uh, their, yeah, their course, members and protect those professionals. Yeah. But we, I think we were very clear, I think, with them that it was an idea of a celebration of amateur theatre makers, but also those amateur theatres, theatre makers were incredibly gracious about the professionals. They were looking hmm. at those professionals, how hard they worked, the skill that they put into their work, the, the craft that they showed. So it was a real exchange, I think, mm -hmm. backwards and forwards about amateurs mm -hmm. learning more about how professionals work and professionals learning about how amateurs work as well. And there was lots of knowledge going back the other way, I think. Wow. Yeah. Pauline, what's, what's Brownsea's relation, if any, with the professional theatre? Do you see yourselves as a company that's providing something which the theatres of Bournemouth and Poole and Swanage aren't providing, or, you know, is it something that's over and above the sort of the, sort of the theatre ecology of the area? I think it's, it is almost slightly separate because it is just so different. And we are open to anybody, we're not a club. So anybody can join Brown Sea Open Air Theatre for a season. Yeah. Um, and that's what's so nice every year we just have different people all the time and we have obviously a lot of youngsters who want to go into the profession we've had people who've gone through us who have actually gone into the profession um it is very very different um and it's uh, it in a way it serves the community because not only are we providing a slightly different experience for youngsters i mean people that join they start in april um, well, they audition in January, then they get their scripts. So they're involved from January onwards once they've been given a part. And yeah. it's a real experience to live that whole summer as part of Brownsea Open Air Theatre and come out yeah, at the other end and they have indeed. real friendships yeah. and everything. Then you've got yeah. all the people behind the scene. And I mean, we've got a vast number of people working on set build because that starts in May. Um, and they go over every Sunday for nearly three months building the set. Mm. We've got the people who are building, uh, making costumes. We have a complete costume department, which is um, in a unit on the mainland. And we have managed to get people there who are really very skilled. And they don't just make costumes, they actually research it. They look at materials so that our costumes are very authentic and we have various different periods of costumes so depending what you want for your play and every year more costumes are made for the simple reason that we need to provide specific things or groups of things um, so we do have a vast resource um, on the yeah. mainland and also all the props yeah. are kept there our archives are kept there yeah. um, it, it is vast <laughs> yeah. I mean one I mean two things occur to me one is the is a more recent case of somebody going from the amateur theatre into the professional, and that's uh, Lisa Stawiarski, um, who played Helena in A Midsummer Night's Dream on Brownsea Island. Right, yes. Changed, changed her name when she went professional to Lisa Dillon, uh, and, and you know, has played Kate uh, and Rosaline and Beatrice for, for the RSC among, and won you know, all, those, all those prizes doing, you know, she's a fabulous performer. Um, another poll, uh, as uh, as you gather, 
The other is that one of the things that is, of course, different for the amateur theater is that because people aren't on salaries for what they're doing, but are on salaries, if they're lucky for doing something else, the rehearsal period is organized completely differently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, you've got this kind of summer festival model where the performances are all going to happen in uh, July or August. What's the rehearsal schedule like? Right, we start in April yeah. and we actually work on the mainland uh, in a, a local community centre where we rehearse. Mm -hmm. We then go outside on the mainland for a month. Mm -hmm. And then in um, July, prior to the performance, we go across to the island. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that in itself is magical. You know, you go from work, pick up the little boat at um, Sandbanks, across to the island, and it's just like entering a different world. Mm. Um, and you do three weeks on the island, by which time the set is more or less coming together. So you've actually got the set to rehearse on, which is lovely. I mean, that's a, a great thing because a lot yeah. of amateur theatres, their set goes up literally, you know, the night before they're on it, whereas we have this opportunity. Mm. So it is quite a, an experience to go through all that. It really yeah. is. Um, and presumably within the constraints of that long but slightly intermittent and sort of squeezed into people's leisure time rehearsal schedule, directors um, have, I imagine, a range of different sort of ways of conducting rehearsal and, and approaches to the craft and approaches to what they want their actors to be able to do. Yeah, a lot of directors, and one in particular, has as soon as the auditions are over and, and, the car, and they're cast, she has one-to-ones with all the cast, even people that are just walking on, mm -hmm. so that they understand how they relate to other characters. Mm -hmm. um, she'll even give them names and things, as I say, if you, you're just a walk-on part, so that you know how you relate to the rest of the play. And it gives, um, especially youngsters, time to discuss their character um, decide how they're going to do it, and, which is wonderful because it gives them a lot of groundwork prior to actually starting yeah. rehearsals. And obviously rehearsals are all, all evening. And yeah. sometimes towards the end, we may have things during the day. Also, we're very fortunate because prior to rehearsals, um, I'll say now that Michael Dobson is one of our honor honorary patrons, which is wonderful. But we well, all one of your one of your recovering ex actors, which is actor, uh, yes, and no. also I didn't know that, Michael. Yeah, and we also have Andrew Jarvis, who's a Shakespearean actor. Yeah, yeah, he yeah a he's, a, he's a proper actor. Yeah. yeah, he does a workshop, so we have a whole day with him, which is mm. just wonderful, absolutely brilliant. Um, so that's a really nice start for the cast. So that before they start rehearsals, they have this workshop with Andrew. I think one of the things I observed when I was working with amateur theatre makers is that it's tempting to think of amateur theatre makers as amateur in all senses, but, but actually within the room, you have a huge range of skills and experiences. You have project managers, you have nurses, you have doctors, you have all sorts of people in that room who are bringing lived experience to it, but, but also genuine practical skills to their sense. So I find amateur theatre makers to be on the whole, supremely organised uh, uh, as well, because uh, because actually there is a huge number of professionals working in that room. We when we brought um, amateur theatre technicians to the RSC, and we did a really nice session with them, sharing how we worked and uh, and the way that we used our technology here at the RSC. And there was a lovely moment where uh, one chap in his 30s we, we said look this is the lighting board we're using here and so you've got to remember it's under quite a lot of pressure you might be shining these lights on uh, Patrick Stewart or Ian McKellen and and really if you if this messes up you know you're in big trouble so it's quite a lot of pressure and one we said anybody want to have a little play so and chap came up uh, this uh, chap in his 30s came up used the board very proficiently stepped back when Oh, you were really confident with that. You worked well with that. What What do you do in your J job? And he said, oh, I'm a major in the British Army. 
Uh, and, he, <laughs> and he just returned from Afghanistan uh, flying helicopters in, in Afghanistan. And, and our, uh, we sort of, sh suddenly that dynamic of going, oh, we're quite important and we're quite high status <laughs> suddenly changed. And we went, oh, yeah, that's quite a lot of pressure, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, we're just doing some theatre stuff. <laughs> so sort of that idea of those real life experiences that have direct, he told his lovely story that in the sense that he'd, um, the same gimbals or pivots that they used on the cannons on the front of the Apache helicopters was the same one they used on the moving lights. And he mm -hmm. said that he had swapped some in and out uh, yes. in his time in the army. So I think that that idea of, of sets of skills of professionals and skills being lots of crossover with that, I think, with with amateur theatre. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, you know, I was, I was, I was try to hand it, hand it over to you, that sense that one of the things people come to amateur theatre for is a rest from the status conflicts of their everyday lives uh, uh, in another set of status conflict. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, it's, 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 a, um, it's a different game, it's a different world where, where different, different experiences and skills are suddenly uh, quite differently valued and of, of quite different use or of no or of no use at all and um, one of the other observations i was saying michael about, about i had of amateur theater makers i think some people um from outside that and some people within the profession or outside amateur theater would feel well this is all about dressing up or this is all about showing off or this is all about themselves mm -hmm. in some yeah. sense i found uh, the the with amateur theater makers it was more like um an adrenaline sport in, mm -hmm. in that sense because it was actually doing something that was incredibly difficult uh that took a lot of nerve that was uh, a rush of adrenaline uh, and in some senses it was that kind of fe that feeling of being on stage that taking those risks those performing and i had a lot of admiration for that i think it felt more like people who wanted to do an adrenaline sport something that was challenging something that was difficult and if you like shakespeare for those people represented a kind of Mount Everest, represented yeah. a marathon. It was the ultimate. I want to do Shakespeare. We yeah, worked yeah. with soldiers suffering from combat stress. And, and we sort of said, why, why would you want to do Shakespeare? There are other plays, there are other things perhaps you, you could do. And no, I want to do Shakespeare. I want to do, in their mind, not necessarily ours, the best. I want to do the, the, the most challenging work. And I want to take that on and do it really well. And I think the other thing from outside, amateur theatre people thinking that people don't care if it's good or not or they don't mind or they won't be that actually we found people hugely committed to the work they they were doing yeah. and absolutely yeah. Yeah. as committed as a professional to want to get this right and want to do this as well as they could possibly do yeah um here's a question for both of you do you think there are members of the audience for non-professional shakespeare who would not normally go and see professional shakespeare do you feel that in brown on brown scene it may be i mean i I wouldn't know, but it may be the case. But I think from what I know of our audience, it does seem to be an event to them. You know, yeah. this, is this yeah. going to the island, they come back year after year, um, they follow us and, and it is that experience. And, you know, coming back on the boat at night with the stars and, and it's magical and it, it is yeah. an experience. So to answer your question, I don't know. <laughs> really. Yeah. I think, yeah. Pauline, that's really interesting to hear you say that because one of the phrases that you'll hear bandied around in professional theatre when we're talking about the ideas for productions is we'll always be saying, we want this to be a real event. We want this to be an event production, a real event moment, and the journey of how people get there. And as they come through the foyer, they'll experience this. And I think that's that idea of an amateur, quite often, I think an amateur theatre production is an event. It's a big moment around what's happening on stage. And I think that's a, a, a really sort of key, key concept to that idea. But yeah. we did find with open stages, that people would come to an amateur theatre production that wouldn't come perhaps to an RSC production. They might go, actually, this feels a bit heavy and I'm a little bit in, intimidated by the RSC. I'm a little bit coming to this, all, coming all this way, coming into this room. Whereas actually people would try out Shakespeare because it was fun, it was enjoyable. I was going to come along and say, perhaps I might see one of my friends in the show. Perhaps it's because it's happening in my community. And there doesn't feel to be the same number of barriers 
or the same worry that I might not understand this. That, so I think it had access to an audience sometimes we, we don't. And that was the other th reason why we, we were very keen on working with amateur theatre makers. It yeah. introduced yeah. more people for the first time to Shakespeare in many ways, at least as many as the RSC does. Yeah. yeah. I think we're particularly lucky on Brancy Island because of the fact that you have this boat journey there. You can have it's... your picnic beforehand. You know, you've got beautiful grass around the theatre. So it is the whole package as well as the play. Yeah. 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 As, yeah. yeah. As, as foyer experiences go, Pool Harbour is pretty good. And yeah. if the RSC could bring it to Stratford, they would they would certainly be, be, be onto something. Um, but publicity is so different for, for non-professional theatres since so much of it's word of mouth and so much of it is the cast wanting all their friends and family to come. Um, regardless, I mean, it's not it's not a self-selected, necessarily a self-selected group of theatre connoisseurs. Um, it, it is indeed as much of the community mm -hmm. that actors and those um, backstage people live in as they can possibly persuade to come. Um, I mean, my sense is, is that I get a very different demographic around me on Brownsea than I would ever get in Stratford. Yeah. Um, and a quite different relation to to what's happening where, where so much of the you know some of the it's it's very different to see an actor in a professional show an RSC show whatever else who's being very interestingly cast against type to seeing because you're comparing them to other parts you've seen them in to seeing somebody you know yeah playing yeah. Yeah. Something appearing as yeah. you know Richard II or, or, or whoever else it might be, and and even where people don't know each other, it's someone from your own community. So I think it's the, it is that sort of thing that we're we're always chasing of of theatre by the people for the people. Yeah. It is you're seeing yourselves upon stage, you're seeing members of your own community. It's the community performing to one another. If you described uh, an amateur theatre production. To, to the Arts Council uh, and said, we've, we've got this, this group, they're, they're performing in their own community, they've taken on a, a Shakespeare play, uh, and actually one of the, the guys playing the main part, he's the man who works at the local post office, this other guy works in the garage, and they go, wow, this sounds like an incredible, uh, incredible um, project of some mm -hmm. kind. What is it? Oh, we call it amateur theatre. They go, oh, yeah. That, yeah. That, uh, I that idea of, of amateur theatre, when you describe the actual parts of an amateur theatre what it mm. takes to do it it is and it is the dream project of, uh, of mm. theatres to have uh, communities making theatre for them for themselves and those audiences seeing themselves on stage quite often our act at the RSC our, our work I like to think is of a very high standard but quite often our, our actors are very different from the people who are, are in the audience uh, they're perhaps a little bit younger they've gone through a set of training they're living a certain life that is very different perhaps than some of those people yeah. in, in that yeah. audience yeah. and that's a different a different kind of theatre yeah I mean, we, we also at Brancy have um we're fortunate enough to have sponsors and they bring clients across mm. to the island to see the show um, so there again, that's bringing in another demographic. Yeah. Um, Are there bits of the Poole and Bournemouth community you think Brownsea doesn't reach and, and would like to? Um, we, we've tried to sort of <clears throat> involve, we, we do a lot of talks in the community, and that's mm. often how we get volunteers, how we get audience. Mm -hmm. We've also linked with various organisations where youngsters um, have got specific problems and they can get involved uh, in Brownsea as a volunteer. So mm -hmm. we do try and link to other areas of the community in order to bring Brownsea to them, as it were, mm -hmm. and also often getting involved, especially if you're young, in something like that, um, yeah. does an awful lot for self-esteem. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm very people. impressed that you know, as, as I said earlier, I'm very impressed by the amount that Brownsea has done during the pandemic. I'm particularly impressed that as a as an unfunded, non-professional theatre group, you've produced these activity boxes for children. Yes, I was just going to say we've got uh, Shakespeare things. I think it was astonishing. Tell yeah. us more about that. Yeah, basically, because <clears throat> youngsters were off school and um, 
in lockdown, we decided to do this stir, stir up Shakespeare project. And the idea was to try and connect with the younger group. We created activities linked to Romeo and Juliet because that was going to be our next production. Um, we tried to do things that um, children could do independently, but we also added things that would be fun to do with parents. Um, we put on things that were actually quite challenging for older children, which obviously they could do on their own. And we also got uh, theatre professionals involved so they could hear them speak about the theatre. And we tried to make these activities so that youngsters could really discover what the roots of live theatre are. Mm -hmm. And we want to try and carry that on when we're up and running so that we can actually have projects yeah. prior to our production and follow up projects after our production, because then once youngsters have seen the production, the whole thing becomes much more real to them. But yes, okay. and, and that's taking off now. So, and that's on our website. So yeah, we just try well, to think of ways we could link with the community. Yeah, it's tremendously impressive. Um, um, well, you, you both are, um, but we've run out of time. Uh, so if you if you want to learn more about what Brown Sea Open Air Theatre are doing, Google Brown Sea Open Air Theatre, you'll find their astonishing website, which is, you know, bears comparison with the RSCs at its best. Uh, and if you want to learn more about the long ignored massive world of non-professional performance, there's a very good book on the subject called, <laughs> called uh, Shakespeare and Amateur Performance, uh, published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, who's that by, Michael? I, I, now, who is it? Oh, it's by me. That's right. Yeah. So, so uh, do buy that excellent book in which you'll learn even more about Brownsea. Um, and you may find Ian mentioned as well. Um, but, um, you know, meanwhile, thanks for tuning in. Uh, and do log on for our next session at two. Uh, uh, the question of how Shakespeare can uh, create a more equal society. Uh, you know, let's hope we can all live in the utopia that is Brownsea for three weeks of the of the summer. Uh, thank you very much for thank you. being part of this. Thank session. you. Good. See you next time. <laughs>